Um, so here we go from logs to a uh, service that is built on a combination of sampled events and the metrics that capture all of the things in between the samples. Um, I won't dig much into Vivid Cortex. I think probably most of you have some familiarity with us. We have the booth in front of the doors at the expo hall, so come see us there if you're interested. Um, Peter and Vadim asked me to come and speak about how our time series platform behind all of this works. Um, it's a, a very large set of data that we capture um, uh, across a lot of production systems, and uh, it's really fast, it's extremely efficient, um, and that matters a lot for economic reasons, and it gives really deep insight into systems. Um, and unfortunately, we weren't able to find any existing systems like open source um, ready to go out of the box systems that would do what we needed, so we had to build our own, which was not really my first preference. Um, I like to use other things instead of building things, uh, but this was an area where we felt we needed to innovate, and history has borne out that it was a good choice for us. So um, you probably, now that I've kind of seen how much of a time series data track there is here, you probably know a lot about it, time series data, and you've probably been uh, uh, told about what time series data is a lot, and uh, you don't really need this. Um, so I'm gonna spare you a whole bunch of this stuff. It comes from events. So events are the original time series data, and then there's a lot of other ways that you can transform that into your typical metric system, like Datadog or something like that. Those metrics represent aggregations of the events. Um, there is no one true time series data type. Uh, for a lot of people, what they think about is like uh, KDB Plus, it's a time series database that perhaps uh, some of us here have heard of, but a lot of us have not. It is um, a commercial time series database that is used for some of the most demanding time series workloads in the world. Um, you know, real time stock trading and things like that at, at scales that really kind of make us look pretty pitiful um, in the monitoring world, honestly. Um, so there's, there's a, there's a lot of data out there that is one form or another of time series, but all of it has the characteristics of um, a number at a point in time or um, information at a point in time. It may be multidimensional. Uh, metrics are kind of a one-dimensional degenerate case of that. Um, and the, uh, the canonical example of stock ticker data actually is illustrative because a lot of times, you know, if you get in the car at the end of the day and you're driving home, and the, the little three minute blurb of news at the top of the hour comes on and they go, you know, the Dow closed up three times, and you hear sort of that one little data point about how the whole stock market did during that whole day. That's kind of like a very coarse aggregate. The, um, the, the fine grained aggregate would be if you looked at every one of the tickers at let's say once a second throughout the day, uh, you would get lots and lots of time series, and you would get lots and lots of points along the time series, and then if you looked at the original trades from which those came, that's even finer grained, higher velocity time series data. Okay, so um, in metrics and monitoring and systems uh, monitoring, we have a lot of similar kinds of data with um, ultimately similar kinds of roll-ups in most systems. So uh, there are trade-offs. Um, you've just been, many of you were in this talk before, and Charity talked about a lot of those trade-offs. Um, so coming from the stream of events, there's always some kind of um, uh, trade-offs that need to be made. You're either trading off observability by reducing things in aggregate, or you're trading off by sampling and throwing away and ignoring a bunch of your data. Um, I'm, by the way, I'm not a big fan of sampling as Charity is. Um, you'll see later how I like to blend the, the samples and the metrics together. Um, so the, the options are you can capture the full original event stream. This is really costly. Um, picture your high-loaded MySQL server, for example, maybe it's 20,000, we have customers who are doing 40,000 and more queries per second. That is 40,000 events per second. Um, plus add in connection events and a whole bunch of other stuff, call it 50,000 events per second and we're good. Um, and these are real world, I mean this is not benchmarks in a clean room somewhere, these are real world workloads. So uh, if you start looking at what it costs across a fleet of 1,000 servers all doing 50,000 queries per second per month, if you just add up what your Splunk bill is gonna be, um, I mean, it is a jaw-dropping, stunning amount of money. Um, forget Splunk, let's just put it into S3 buckets, and then we'll index it with big data later. Even more money. Um, forget that, let's put it into Elk, even more money. <laughs> it's like, there is no sort of like, uh, there is no cheap answer to, to retaining everything at, at true high scale. Um, 
So there's another option, which is to aggregate these events um, into metrics. And um, sampling, which ignores and discards data, um, both of these are basically, there's, there's a, there's, they're basically proxies for some kind of compression. Um, compression, usually when, when we think of compression, we're thinking of something like zip that takes the original data and you can reconstitute the original data later. You'll see um, a little bit later in this talk how Vivid Cortex compresses things in a way that you can't quite get the original data back, but you get something very, very close to it. Um, and by doing that, we save a lot of uh, costs. So, um, I've just said this. Um, the one thing that I didn't say is sampling. Why I'm not a big fan of sampling. Sampling in a representative way is really, really hard to do right. And it's 2017, and I don't like having discussions about the right way to ignore a lot of what your systems are trying to tell you. Um, you can Google, you know, how to sample logs or, or something like that, and you'll find all sorts of things. You know, you should sample one every period of time. You should sample one every n. You should sample, um, but also keep the one with the maximum attribute. All of these are sort of destructive of the original data in some way, or they have really, really bad edge cases. Like if you're sampling one of every n, and you happen to get a really high cardinality stream, you're just gonna get all this repetitive noise, again, at, at extremely high cost. And uh, the risk of that is, is not immaterial. It's not just financial risk, but it's also that you can overwhelm the systems that are receiving those. Um, if you sample one every period of time, then you're going to be extremely non-representative. And uh, if you sample in some other ways, like sampling the max event per query time, uh, per period of time, uh, you'll also get really non-representative results. Um, so sampling is not simple. Sampling representatively is even harder. Um, the sampling algorithm that we use at Vivid Cortex, we built ourselves. Um, it's quite complex. We wrote an ebook about it. You're welcome to download it. I think I would, I would call it state of the art. Um, oh, the worst kind of sampling of all is slow query log sampling. So like in MongoDB, by default, the profiler only profiles things that are over 100 milliseconds, which in MongoDB world is like an eternity. Um, I mean, seriously, if you have queries that are over 100 milliseconds in MongoDB, you're probably doing something wrong. Um, and the, probably the most of your queries should be much less, like one to 20 milliseconds or something like that. And a lot of high frequency, very short events can add up to a huge load on your server. And you cannot responsibly ignore that. You just can't. So slow query log sampling is a horrible, horrible thing to do in my opinion. Um, it gives you kind of the worst sort of lie about how your systems are actually performing. Um, so most of us in monitoring turn things into metrics. And metrics are a way of aggregating such that no matter how many things occur in a time period, you end up with a single number. It just turns into a larger number or a smaller number, but that's no more or less costly, okay? Um, so the, the, the benefit is that you've got a much smaller data set. Um, hopefully represents the original data set in some way. Uh, you do definitely lose information about the distribution of values in your original data set. Um, but this is, there, are, there are ways that you can um, uh, mix together metrics and samples, as I'll talk about a little bit later, to compensate for that. And it's, it's essentially a, a method of compression. So here I've you know, just thrown up some arbitrary numbers, you know, 24,000 to one compression ratio by uh, compressing by, by aggregating over 24,000 events. The problem with this, as Charity pointed out, is you can't disaggregate what you've aggregated. So you cannot go back to the original data. There are a bunch of ways to work around this. Um, for example, one of the ways that we do this at Vivid Cortex is we will do uh, regression to tease out multidimensionality from things that have had the dimensionality aggregated. Um, that doesn't always work, but it's surprisingly useful in a lot of cases. Um, and then the, the other problem with um, aggregation is that at low throughput, like low cardinality um, categories of queries, for example, you don't actually gain much. Um, if you're going to get one event per second and turn it into a metric that says 36, um, you might as well have just captured the original sample. So definite trade-offs on this. Um, the Vivcore Tech solution is some stuff becomes metrics and some stuff becomes samples. And the combination of those two, I believe, is, uh, it may not be the best of both worlds, but it's a very good of both worlds. And 
gives you a surprisingly high level of um, information about how your systems perform. And this is all explained in our ebook, and it's like not patent pending, and you're welcome to do it, and I would love for somebody to do vivid cortex for log data or other data. Because um, we're gonna keep focused on the, the data tier, the database tier in vivid cortex. So, um, so somebody please go do this. I've been saying that at talks for years and nobody has done it yet. So let's talk about how we built our system, um, kind of knowing the, the trade-off space that goes into this. Um, so we measure primarily, I mean, we measure a lot of stuff. There isn't anything that you can get from a typical uh, monitoring system like Datadog or Prometheus or something like that that you don't also get typically a lot more from Vivid Cortex. All of the standard status counters and CPU utilization and disk and blah, 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 blah. It's all there. What we have that other systems don't have is workload behavioral data. So we're measuring that workload, we're measuring the inputs and the outputs to the database, all of it, no sampling. So your full query workload, and then we are categorizing that um, by abstracting queries, scrubbing out the private stuff, and checksumming what's left, and then you get a category of queries, what we call a fingerprint or an abstract. Um, and so then we, we actually aggregate along those, so we get a whole bunch of multi-dimensional data for each of those query categories. So for example, if it's a query that maybe puts an item into the user's shopping cart, we'll have throughput, we'll have latency, we'll have error counts, we'll have you know, a whole bunch of stuff um, for each of those. And on typical systems, there can be anywhere from thousands to tens of thousands of different kinds of queries that run against database servers. Um, I was poking around a little bit um, in production systems that we monitor, anywhere from 2,000, I, I need to do a histogram, it would be really interesting to do a histogram, but I think my sense is that the peak is somewhere around 10,000 distinct types of queries for most systems, and some of them go up to 50,000. So there's a lot, a lot of data here. Um, consider that each of those is uh, turned into one second uh, frequency metrics, and that each of those is multidimensional. Um, so you're multiplying and, and creating a lot of metrics. And that's, that's per server. Um, and th these metrics can be something that you know in advance, like you, you always know that if you measure CPU utilization, it's gonna be a number, right? What you don't know is if you measure the query that puts the item into the shopping cart, did that actually occur in this time range? So there, may, there might not be anything. And then there will be things that are, uh, there, there'll be things that run basically constantly and um, ultimately will have a very dense metric, but there'll also be things that will be like that one batch job that one runs once a day, or that ad hoc query that somebody just ran kind of in an exploratory way, and only happened once ever in all of history. Um, so there's this wide range of sparseness in our data. Um, and then this on the bottom here is kind of the, the um, simplest form of how you might represent our time series metrics. It's a label, it's a timestamp, and then it's a value, and the value in our case is a number. All right, and so this is kind of simplified um, just to avoid visual clutter on the slide, but that's essentially what it comes down to. So um, when we were building our time series backend, um, we evaluated requirements to, you know, we didn't wanna go look for a solution and then figure out what the problem was later. Um, so we wrote, large requirements, documents, um, based on what we believed our workload would be, what kinds of questions we needed to answer of the data. Um, I think we, you know, history has shown that we've done a pretty good job. There are a couple of areas where we wish that we could dig a little bit deeper, uh, but we're not far off from where we wanted to be. Um, and this is, you know, four years on. So a couple of things, um, you know, lots and lots more data, so just kind of keep that in mind. Um, we wanted this to be economically feasible like lots and lots of monitoring companies go out of business because they have, um, in many cases, negative gross margins. That means that their systems cost more money than their revenue. Um, and so our primary requirements were speed, scalability, efficiency, and fit to the desired data model. What's different about Vivid Cortex is that we have lots and lots of series, uh, this high cardinality, um, almost arbitrary cardinality, and sparseness, I mentioned that already. We have categories of queries that are related and need to be analyzed together. Um, top K ranking within categories. These categories can be very large, like 50,000, um, over potentially long periods of time and very, uh, very high resolution during those time periods. Also, it's write heavy. 
most of the data, you know, the data is written in there constantly, and most of that data is probably not going to be read um, very much, if at all. So typical time series databases, like if you ask somebody, what's a good time series database? They say Cassandra is really good for that use case. Um, for our use case, actually, Cassandra would, would be far more costly um, than, uh, than we could ever tolerate, like a couple of orders of magnitude. And there are lots and lots of other systems that when we evaluated, it was like there's just no economic way to make this work. Um, so, and, and there are other things about a lot of open source uh, time series databases that don't really fit with a uh, SaaS hosted multi-tenant model like the security requirements, auditability, things like that. Uh, they're also almost always optimized for a few dense metrics rather than lots and lots of sparse metrics. And they assume this low cardinality and they assume a workload where you're typically identifying a single metric and reading along it rather than, for example, top K ranking over 50,000 metrics that happen to be related to each other. So our architecture is a SaaS, we're a SaaS platform. Um, it's fully hosted in the cloud. We happen to be in AWS. And lots and lots of things that matter to our customers. Um, it is highly sharded. Uh, I mean, these are all sort of standard things. There's nothing like really revolutionary about this, but it's just the, the environment within which we build. Um, and how we map multi-tenancy onto that, I think I'm gonna skip this in the interest of time, actually. Um, I want to talk more about the interesting problem. So the, the interesting problem is that uh, time going left to right, you kind of get lots and lots of metrics and you sort of write them down and time, you know, you, your, your columns advance this way. But then when you read them, you're identifying metrics or categories of metrics and you're reading this way. So that's where you have to choose either read optimized or write optimized and something has to give in between there, right? Um, so indexing is typically the read or write optimization um, vector for this. So you, there's a couple of options. You could index with the timestamp first, in which case it becomes really efficient to just append things to the end of that file growing to the right. Or you could uh, index uh, metric first, in which case it becomes optimal for reading those stripes of data from left to right, but you can't have both. Right? So there's kind of an iron triangle there that, that you can't really get away from. And if you don't index and you are just scanning everything for every query, uh, then you're gonna have a bad time when you have high concurrency under high load and we were building for high concurrency and high load, you know, large user bases from the beginning. So, um, you know, you could index both directions but you end up with more problems. Um, there's another common time series database problem that there's a lot of repetition in most time series data. Um, and in fact, the most common value to write into a time series data is zero, zero, <laughs> zero, zero. Um, but there's also the overhead of, um, you know, the, the, the metric name and the timestamp for every value. So if you're writing values one at a time, you typically have lots and lots of repetition. Now this is the kind of thing that can easily be um, uh, optimized away with compression, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we chose to do this a little bit differently, so we vectorize chunks of metrics. And when we put something into our time series store, um, we have the metric name and the uh, timestamp, the beginning timestamp of the vector, and then we have a whole bunch of values just stuffed together. Um, and this makes it a little bit harder to query with SQL, but we knew that we were gonna have a non-SQL interface in front of this. We were gonna have a, a, um, a large-scale service in front of this anyway. So metrics categorization is really important for the top K. Um, if you look at our dashboard, you will see top queries by time. You know, you can then you can switch that by any number of dimensions like you can do top queries by most frequent or top queries by most error causing or whatever it is. Um, and those are categories of related metrics that have to be ranked and sorted. And that turns out to be a really hard problem to do. Um, so ideally, we would like those to be physically co-located so that reading to, to satisfy these, these top guide queries is dense. The, you know, the pages are packed densely full of what we need and we're not scanning like lots of unrelated data to pick out one or two values from each page of data uh, that we need. Um, but our metrics for compression reasons, our binary checksum, the, the metric names are checksums so that they can fit into a binary 64-bit. Um, and so those are essentially randomized and that doesn't allow us any natural sorting using InnoDB. Um, so we label and prefix these categories of metrics with a category ID that keeps them physically co-located. Um, so just a sort of very simple trick but highly effective. 
We also partition by time. So a metric lives um, across lots and lots of tables, each of which is labeled with a timestamp. And we, we uh, use this partitioning, um, this partitioning intelligence is built into our time series API servers. Um, and the, uh, we don't use something like you know, native MySQL partitioning. We tried that in the beginning. I should, <laughs> I, I should, know, I should have known better than to do that. Uh, it turned out that MySQL's locking, even in the newer versions of MySQL, it turned out to, to cause a lot of problems with uh, partitioning. Um, schema changes are super painful, so we don't change schema. Instead, we retain read compatibility with old versions. We put the version number into, this, into the table name. Um, again, just sort of naive, really, really effective. And um, so we have these, these uh, table names that, are, um, that encode information in them directly in the table name. Um, and instead of like repeating in column after, you know, row after row after row uh, the information. And then uh, we have these, there's more columns in the schema than this, but the, the key thing is that there's a host and a metric that uniquely identifies a metric. And then there's this timestamp that is the beginning of the vector and then a chunk of 60 values. There's a couple of other meta, metadata columns in there because these are effectively sort of uh, floating point values um, encoded one byte at a time. And then there's a primary key um, which NODB uses to cluster that data together. Um, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time again. Um, I think I'm going to end on time, but a little tight. Read path and write path are separate for HA purposes. If you have a long running read and it causes problems, you do not want writes going through the same service or you're going to lose data. Um, and data being late is okay. Data being lost is not okay. Uh, there's definitely, definitely bad to lose data. Um, our data comes out of agents that has a couple of fallbacks. So again, data being late is okay, being lost is not okay, we don't lose data. Um, and it goes into Kafka uh, before it's act back to the agents that was accepted. And then there's actually a couple of services underneath of that. Uh, there's a time series directory which says where should this chunk of data go? And then there's some other things that are basically um, hand-built indexes inside of MySQL or Redis that allow for optimizing particular read paths. And we don't use MySQL replication. Instead, we're replicating in Kafka in front. So we've got this river of data flowing through our architecture, and every sharded set of MySQL servers has its own consumers that is reading from those. So we have multiple sets of data, but they're all doing their work independently, and we have no dependencies on, on the MySQL replication. Um, which if you haven't done, if you haven't built something in architecture, I highly, highly recommend it to you. Um, we downsample data from one second re resolution to one minute and then ultimately to 10 minute and we keep it for the long term. Um, by default, it's 13 months, so you can look back at last year's Black Friday Cyber Monday spike and plan for this one. Um, there's different tiers of service that we offer, so these things are all totally configurable uh, and that's just built into the services. And when we read, um, the services kind of go and figure out what data actually exists, and then they will read, um, they will read from the lowest resolution data that they can get away from. And that totally depends on what resolution the API request has asked for. It's kind of pointless to, you know, in a 600 pixel wide graph, it's pointless to ask for 10,000 points. Um, and so uh, we'll, we will uh, look at the, the lowest data that we can um, to, uh, we usually have to fill in the end because downsampling runs periodically, and so some of the most recent data is only available in high resolution. Um, there's a whole bunch of special optimizations. Um, some of these are patented and or patent pending. Uh, for example, top K optimizations, because we're doing top K across multiple partitions in parallel, um, across you know, thousands of series, across you know, many, many chunks of data all in parallel, so there's, there's massive fan out. Um, we, we know that distributed top K is a hard problem, and if you actually look into how most systems do it, they kind of go, you know, we're gonna do like top K plus some number, so if we want top 25, let's just get top 50 from each of those and then kind of aggregate them and hope, and that's not good enough for us because there's a lot of really spiky behavior in uh, query performance data. And so it's, it's totally plausible that you could have like the top 50 would be sort of local spikes in each chunk and then there's one thing that never comes into the top 50 across all of those chunks but is actually one of very significant things over the, the whole aggregate and we would miss that. 
Um, so we're not susceptible to that. Um, and we do this in a two-step pass. So there's, uh, there's some approximate um, statistical sketches that get us kind of in the neighborhood, and then we prune that data set down to the final um, data set. And the results are, um, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of the results. We have uh, very good unit economics, which means that we have a strong business, and why that matters is that you can depend on us. Um, unlike a lot of monitoring services that, you know, go out of business or get acquired routinely, uh, we're around. We've got a really, really strong business model, um, and it works. And I think a lot of it is, is, you know, down to just the raw efficiency and the trade-offs that we've made in this, uh, in this time series backend. Um, we did give up some stuff for sure. Um, alternatives, I, I talked about this a little bit before, and I think I'm like two minutes. So, there we go. Um, am I two minutes over, or do I have a couple of minutes for questions? I'm over. All right, sorry about that. <laughs> Fortunately, there's no session right after this. So, <laughs> I will take questions in the hallway.